that we pray that you will uh, consider us uh, as the Lord's church. We are going to be studying the church of our Lord this morning. In Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin there uh, momentarily. And I'm mindful of the question that Jesus asked his disciples. When they came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Some say that thou art John the Baptist or Jonas or Elias, one of the prophets, in fact. Who do you say that I am? I'm paraphrasing uh, that section. Who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus makes a statement to him based on what he has just stated. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevent it. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What an amazing passage where Jesus himself makes a promise that he is going to build his church. And just a couple of quick things to, to point out in that passage. Number one is that promise. That promise, Jesus says, I will build. And it's going to be based on the foundation of what Peter has stated. Thou art the Christ. You are the Messiah, the very Son of the living God. He says, I will build my church based on that, that rock, that statement that you have made, Peter. I'm going to build my church. Not even Hades will be able to prevail against it or me, in fact, in fulfilling this promise. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven making a connection between the church and the kingdom. Now in that promise, the church, the kingdom, our Lord, who is the very Son of the living God, that's what the church is based upon, evidenced in Scripture. And so this morning I want us to spend a little bit of time walking through Scripture to be able to connect those things, to be able to see these things together so that we make no mistake whatsoever about the church that our Lord is talking about, the one upon which he said, I will build, and Hades will not even prevail against it. Oh, he was going to die. That's how he was going to purchase the church. His blood would be shed as we've just memorialized in that feast that we've partaken of. And in so doing... Jesus kept his word, fulfilled the promise, being raised from the Father on the third day. And in so doing, has put all scoffers and all skeptics on notice, so to speak. What Jesus was preparing his apostles in particular for, well, who is it, when you poll those around you, who is it that they are saying that I am? What are you hearing out there on the street about me? Well, we could ask the same question today. What are we hearing about the Lord's church today? I think it's unfortunate that we've kind of come into a, a time when people are seemingly uh, afraid Scared to, to even say the Lord's church is found right here in Scripture. I'll be glad to show it to you. This is what it looks like. This is what Jesus said. He didn't say that he was going to build thousands of denominational groups out there. Oh, no, no, no. That's, no, we're not in different cars on a train going to the same place. See, that, that does not even make sense from what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The church, the kingdom, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. And we're going to see how all of this plays out 
in Scripture. You're going to very quickly see, if honest with Scripture, that in fact, Jesus kept his word. God has, in fact, kept his word. And then we are subject to that word. And if we are going to be saved, it will be in the church that Jesus promised to build. Acts 2.47, and we'll get there momentarily. Let's begin then with this first thought, that the church of our Lord was purposed. In Ephesians chapter 3, where Matthew read just a moment ago, you will notice with me, the Apostle Paul writes and he speaks about those things. There's a, a mystery. And he talked about that mystery that had been hid in the ages or throughout the ages. Jews and Gentiles coming together in one body, the previous chapter would talk about. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, to make all men see, he's talking about his purpose as an apostle. He says, unto me who am least, uh, less than the least of all saints, he would say in verse 8, to make all men see what is the fellowship of that mystery. Where is it all seen? How does it all come together? Where is the fellowship? Where is that joint participation? Where is that community? Where is that togetherness that, is been, that has been hid in the ages, he would talk about? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world, he says, hath been hid in God. God revealed these things slowly to mankind as time would pro progress and as time would, would come toward the, the fullness of time that we read about in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And so he says then, who from the beginning of, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent or for the purpose that now under principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known the manifold wisdom of God by the church. By seeing the church, we're able to see the manifold wisdom of God. The many ways in which God has shown His wisdom to mankind. So when we look at the church, we can see the very wisdom of God. Now, we've heard statements like that before. We've made statements like that before, thinking about seeing God's wisdom in and having a, a community, a, a fellowship, a, a group together, and having them in, in one place, and having them to be able to assemble together, having them to be able to worship God together. He says that this, this fellowship of this mystery, and again in and its context has to do with bringing all persons together in one body. Again, Ephesians chapter 2. But again, he says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, go back with me in Ephesians chapter 1 for just a moment. And notice with me, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. He tells us where the location of those spiritual blessings are to be found. They're in Christ. According, he says, as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We begin to put some things together as we think about the eternal purpose. But notice this phrase. A couple of phrases that get often confused in the, especially the denominational world because of the doctrine, the false doctrine of Calvinism, are, are the words chosen and predestinated. But what we have to understand, and contextually he's pointing out, that God has in fact chosen us. Chosen the Ephesian Christians, and chosen us as we are part of that body as well, and, uh, and, and enjoy in that fellowship, that togetherness, that community, that body. One body, Ephesians 4 and verse 4. But he has chosen us. But not the idea that Calvinism rings throughout the world. 
Now, unfortunately, that has only darkened the, the waters, muddied the waters, so to speak, so that we're, people are, they have a difficult time and they see a word like that and say, okay, well, well, so God has arbitrarily chosen you, but not you, and you, but not you, and you, but not you, and no, you, you, and not you. That's what we're expected to believe ultimately by this particular doctrine. And it's a shameful doctrine as well as it is false. Because what it has done is it has made ugly that very picture that from before the foundation of the world, God had a plan which he purposed in Christ Jesus to save mankind, to save me and you. So yes, he has chosen a people, those people who would follow him. He has chosen a way, that is through Christ, that we might be the beloved, that we might be the accepted in Christ Jesus. And so when we start thinking about this idea of purpose before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. To save me and you. And that's the church. Not only that, we're going to walk back and we're going to look at prophecies. You see, the church was prophesied. Those things were spoken of by uh, long before Jesus came on the scene, long before John the baptizer was there. The prophets of old spoke of these things, the church and the kingdom. Let's take a look together. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, this is an interesting prophecy because this is David and things that God would say directly to David, some specific to his son Solomon reigning on his throne. But there is a duality in this fulfillment of this particular prophecy. And we'll notice how that comes about here in just a moment. But 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now we can see how Solomon would certainly fulfill some of that. David wanted to build the, the temple, a more permanent structure for, uh, for God. He was not allowed to do so because he was a man of war. He had shed much blood. But Solomon would be allowed to build the temple. David making preparations for that as well. But Solomon would build a temple, but that temple would be destroyed on several occasions, in fact. So this has a fulfillment that's greater and goes beyond even Solomon. So let's notice a couple of things together. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. When you think of prophecies, some have counted that there are well over a thousand prophecies that have been fulfilled in Scripture. And when you look at the ones pertaining directly to the Christ, to the Messiah, there are over 300 of those. They too have been fulfilled. We can see their fulfillment in the New Testament. We can see also how those things that were hid in God were unfolding and, and they were getting a little picture of those things along the way. They were able to see a little bit. This is something that's coming, something that's uh, worthy to notice, something that you can look forward to, something that would give you hope in, in those times, marching forward to the fullness of time, as we've already mentioned, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. So Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah is prophesying sometime 700 years before the time of Christ. He says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, so it gives us a time frame, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established, and the top of the mountains shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow unto it. But there are a couple of phrases there. It's going to be established, top of the mountains, exalted above the hills. There will be an exaltation of it. All nations, though, are going to flow unto it. Many people shall, shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. They would be taught what that was going to look like. 
that we're going to be taught about the kingdom. We'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord's house. Shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, he goes on to say. This is recounted even in Micah's prophecy in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Almost word for word that prophecy is given. But let's notice Joel's prophecy. In Joel chapter 2, Joel 2, beginning in verse 28. And it shall come to pass after, afterward, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Upon my servants and upon my handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great and terrible day or notable day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. We have two prophecies then that, that make clear this is, this is going to begin in Jerusalem, that it's going to begin at the last days. There are going to be things that are going to mark that particular event as it's approaching, and it will be that God is going to pour out of His Spirit upon mankind. Well, that goes right along with the idea that they're going to be taught about the kingdom, right? Let us go into the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of His ways. We'll learn more about the kingdom. In Daniel chapter 2, you can look in verse 44, and as Nebuchadnezzar had, had that dream of that colossal image, but he couldn't remember what it was, he wanted his uh, people to tell him what the dream was and then what it meant. They couldn't do it, obviously, but Daniel could through the power of God. And he gave him exactly what he had seen in the dream, and then he interprets it for him. And he talks about that in the days of these kings shall God establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And not only that, when you flip over to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, you see one who, the Son of Man who comes before the Ancient of Days and is delivered unto him a kingdom, again, which shall never be destroyed destroyed. It couldn't be Solomon's temple then. It couldn't be that house of the Lord. It had to be something greater than that. Something that would begin in Jerusalem. Something that would be marked by a, a great and notable event that was going to take place. The miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. We'll note here in just a moment. You have John who comes on the scene. Well, it was prophesied about John as well. The one who had the voice crying out in the wilderness, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was helping to mark and to prepare the way, to make straight the path for the Lord to come on the scene and begin to preach. And so that prophecy of Isaiah 40 verse 3 is seen in Matthew chapter 3 with John the Immerser coming on the scene and preaching there in the wilderness and crying out, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was near. It was close. Jesus himself essentially prophesying, preaching, saying again, Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is near. In Mark 9 and verse 1, he would explain that there are some of you who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God. And there's an interesting phrase in Mark 9 1, come with power. It's going to come with power. There's going to be a marking of that. Well, that's exactly what Joel has said in his prophecy, isn't it? The kingdom. Jerusalem. All nations flowing unto it. 
And then we see John and Jesus both saying, it's near, it's at hand. We'll notice how it is in fact planted. The church is planted. Because the seed is the word of God, Luke 8 and verse 11. The seed is going to be preached. In just a couple of weeks in our summer Bible school, we're going to be looking at parables. And one of, the, one of the first parables we look at is the parable of the seed and sower. The seed is the word of God. It's going to be spread throughout the world. And of course, it's going to fall on different types of soils, hearts. And that good heart represented by that good soil, in it, it's going to bear much fruit. We're going to look at that idea in another point here in just a moment. But I want you to notice this. First, in prophecy, as we talk about the Word of God being planted in the hearts of mankind, isn't that what the prophets of old were doing? They were preparing the people. As, as God would give them revelation to, to share with the people of God on different occasions, to show them there's, a, there's something that is great coming. It is going to be magnificent. It's going to be marked in history and time by, by these things. It's going to take place. It's going to begin there in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. The Word of God is going to be taught there as well. He's going to show us exactly His ways that we should follow Him. That's the same thing, though, that even Moses, as a prophet of God, would say. There's a prophet like unto me, whom you will hear. And he goes on in that chapter to say, if you don't, this is Deuteronomy chapter 18, 5 and following, that essentially if you do not listen to him, you're going to be destroyed. You'll be lost. So first in prophecy, second in promise by Jesus, that he was going to build his church, that those things were taking place, that it was at hand, it was nearing. So let's go then to Acts chapter 2. And let's see where it all culminates, where it all comes together. In Acts chapter 2. We begin to see prophecy fulfilled. In Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, that is the apostles, were all with one accord in one place. We know that from the previous chapter. They gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias. He was numbered with the eleven apostles. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they, the apostles, were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance or the ability to do so. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Two things to pick up on real quick. The apostles baptized with the Holy Spirit. Joel's prophecy it marks those very things. And we can see later when people are confused and they're marveling at this and they're saying, these men are full of new wine. Some are mocking this. And Peter, verse 14, stands up with the 11 and says, these men are not... In fact, drunken as you suppose, it's the third hour of the day. It's 9 a.m. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter, by inspiration on that day, says this is what Joel was talking about. This is what Joel, the prophet, was marking in time. This great and notable day of the Lord has in fact come. That's what's taking place. Back back up the verses we read to begin with. In verse 5, they were dwelling at Jerusalem. We already know they were staying there in Jerusalem from chapter 1. But they were also dwelling at Jerusalem, devout men. Jews, it says. Devout men. Out of 
every nation under heaven. What are those nations? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, and on. You can read the list there beginning in verse 9 down through verse 11. And they're amazed, saying, how is it that we are hearing these men speak to us in our own language, in our own tongue? They were shocked by that. But you remember Isaiah's prophecy? All nations shall flow unto it. This is the beginning of that. And what's amazing is that throughout the book of Acts, we can see, in fact, how all of that unfolds. If you look back in chapter 1, though, in verse 8, Jesus had told his apostles, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. This day of Pentecost, you see the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God. One of the things that you pick up on, hopefully here, is that how many Jews were there dwelling in Jerusalem? Maybe above a million, it's estimated. What an opportunity. And then when you read Galatians 4 and verse 4, when it talks about when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made under the law, born of a woman. It begins to hopefully cause us to see this is the very wisdom of God. All this as it begins to unfold and Peter recounts Joel's prophecy after he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes through all of that. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, verse 21. And so then he, he hones in he, and, and he draws them in a little bit more. And he says, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. He begins to preach the gospel. He preaches unto them, Jesus of Nazareth. They know Jesus of Nazareth. They need to see him in this light how all of this has unfolded for their benefit, for their salvation. He says, A man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. You've witnessed this. You've seen his miracles. You know this. You yourselves, he says, can attest to this. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands of crucified and slain. So now he calls them, in fact, murderers. He says, God attested to the fact that he was his only begotten son by miracles, wonders, and signs that he did in, in, your, in the middle of you. And you saw it. You knew it. But you still crucified him. You still, you still put him to death. Verse 24, but God, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, he's on my right hand, that I should not be moved, and therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, he says, my flesh shall rest in hope. Why? Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. You remember Jesus' promise in Matthew 16, when he says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevent it. Though he would die, he would not be left there. No, verse 24, God raised him up. This Jesus, verse 32, hath God raised up, whereof we, the apostles, are all witnesses. And therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear, this marvelous thing that you're seeing before you, that we're able to speak in all these different languages so that men out of every nation under heaven can understand us in their own tongue. This is God's wisdom coming to pass before you but it's marking something that is even greater maybe than they could have imagined. 
And so he says in verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. And notice their response. And when they heard this, it's as if they were stabbed directly in their hearts. They were cut to the heart. They were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Is all hope lost? You remember that phrase that Peter had said earlier? That God, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge, by His foreknowledge, He has done this. He sent Jesus to die. This is part of the wisdom of God to save you. All is not lost, all hope is not lost. There's a way of salvation. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. There, you could have your sins remitted, washed away. The promise is unto you, he says. Those Jews gathered there in Jerusalem. And devout men out of every nation under heaven and to your children and to all that are afar off. You see, you go back to Ephesians chapter 3 and that eternal purpose of God or plan of God making known by the church the manifold wisdom of God and so that the apostles could show forth And particularly, Paul says, me, least of all the saints, is this grace been given to make all men see what is the fellowship of that mystery. Jews and Gentiles in one body. Ephesians chapter 2. Those who have been chosen in Christ away before the foundation of the world, predestined for the salvation of mankind. You go on and read through here and you find that they gladly received His word, verse 41, and were baptized the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47 says, Praising God, having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They would be taught the seed would be planted, the church, the kingdom would be planted. Not only that, you see already in this chapter how there was a prospering. In its very beginning, 3,000 souls have been added to that number of saved, added to the church. Within just a very short while, another 2,000. So the number is over 5,000. And you begin to see other passages, such as Acts 6 and verse 1. (coughs) In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, the number of disciples were It says, this time, drop down to verse 7, the word of God increased. There was a problem that came up. The problem was dealt with by divine inspiration, led by the apostles, the church involved in that work and how it was going to operate now, how it was going to be accomplished so no one was overlooked in the daily ministering unto those widows. And it says the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem Greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. We're sometimes hard on the Jewish leaders. 
But this passage does give us some hope when we think about that a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Those who were most acquainted with the temple services and the sacrifices and, and the daily working of the temple and all of those things and the word of God as it directed their steps every day as they did that work for God in the temple. A great number of them clued in on the fact that Jesus is the Christ. And in the church is seen the manifold wisdom of God. They were obedient, it says, to the faith. You can go on to chapter 9, verse 31. The churches, <clears throat> then had the churches rest throughout Judea and Galilee, Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and comfort of the Holy Spirit, and were multiplied. They were prospered. They were growing. The church was growing. Even through those difficulties that they were having to overcome. Chapter 12, verse 24. You can see it again. The Word of God grew and multiplied. And every time the Word of God would grow and multiply, that seed being planted of the kingdom, the church is growing. The church is prospering. But not only that, I think that we can see not only is the church prospering here and we see the, from the, the, the term multiplied being used, an increase being used, but I think we also see it in the workers. You see, throughout the New Testament, we read of the work. We read of the mission work of, of Peter early, especially in the book of Acts. And the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions after that, the rest of the book of Acts. We read of those letters that Paul would write and how he would speak of fellow laborers in the kingdom. And so I wrote down just a few to make the point here. Of course, we have Paul and Barnabas, then, then Silas, Timothy, Titus, Luke, Mark, Epaphroditus, Aristarchus, Epaphras, uh, and Andricondus, or Andronicus, rather, Junia, Onesimus, Philemon, Aquila, Priscilla, Archippus, Clement, Euodia, Syntyche, Judas, Tychicus, Sopater, Trophina, Trophosa, Persis, Phoebe, Mary, Onesiphorus, on and on the list. If you look through your New Testaments, you're going to see those workers in the kingdom. And so what you're seeing ultimately is a display of the church and its growth and the fact that it is prospering throughout the world. The gospel is spread. Jerusalem, all Judea, go up a little bit north to Samaria, and from there, the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 1 and verse 8. And so as we bring this to a conclusion, we think about the church promised by our Lord, purposed in the eternal plan of God, prophesied by all those Old Testament prophets leading up to the fullness of time where the seed would be planted, the seed of the kingdom would be planted. In Acts chapter 2, it actually all unfolds before our very eyes. We can read in the pages of our New Testaments. And we see the church prospering. But one thing that we have to remember is that all of this was done by our Lord who shed His blood to purchase the church. Acts 20 and verse 28, as Paul called for the Ephesian elders to meet him in Miletus, this is one of the things that, that he reminded of them, that they had been, in fact, made overseers, that they were the shepherds of the flock, that they were to tend the flock, they were to feed the church of God, over which the Holy Spirit had made them overseers, in fact. There was going to be difficulty that would arise. There was going to be false teaching that would come about even from them, their own selves, he says. There was warnings given to them. But ultimately, the church shows forth the manifold wisdom, number one, and love of God, number two. When I think about the love of God, that is seen in the fact that he purchased the church through his own death, literally through the shedding of of his blood. When I think about what our Lord endured, that he might be 
the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. That means He is the Savior of the church. That means that we have to be a part of the church. It's not an afterthought as some teach. This is the forethought. This is the eternal thought of God. To save mankind through the sending of His only begotten Son to purchase the church. To save me and you. Have you obeyed the gospel? Wherein, according to Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we meet the very blood of Jesus. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death? Where did He shed His blood? The Bible tells us in His death. You remember that soldier piercing his side? He had already yielded up the ghost, the Bible says. He had already shouted out, it is finished. Those last words that he cried out. But out forth flowed blood and water from his side that was pierced for you and for me. Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Have you taken those steps by believing in Jesus as the Son of God, repenting of sin, confessing your faith in Christ and being baptized into Christ, having put on Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27, and thereby added to that number of saved, the body of Christ, the church, the kingdom, they are one and the same. Acts 2 and verse 47. If you've not taken those steps, I want you to consider carefully your decision this morning. Maybe you've done that. As a member of the body of Christ, it is possible that we might, in weakness, fall away. That we might be tempted to sin and we might give in to those things. Repent of that. Ask God to forgive you. If it's of a public nature and we can help and, and those things need to be made known as, as your repentance is seen by others, let us help you with that. And let us pray for you and pray with you. Let us hold you up and walk together as the body of Christ and show truly the rest of the world the manifold wisdom of God that they are able to see then in that sweet fellowship that is found in the body of Christ in His church. If we can help you this morning, you have a need. Come to the front while we stand, while we sing.